This episode is just a summary of clips from other episodes that I have combined together to form Secrets of Atlantean Stonework. The main techniques were, number one, direct bedrock carving to create structures, and they were using machines with technology to scoop out the rock, and that technology used vibration. Then there were the massive megalithic block cutting and building techniques that were using real natural stone, and it also used vibration technology. So this is the same for slicing rock, same technology for cutting shafts, but some of them were different machines. Number three was megalithic polygonal block construction, and this was using artificial stone. Number four is also a form of polygonal construction, but this is using stone softening techniques. But this technique was only used when we couldn't do it one of the easier ways, because it required a large amount of a type of sap from a particular tree and some white powder, which came from bird droppings. Number five were prefabricated blocks. This were just for temporary locations. There was a very strong preference for building in places that are inaccessible. So examples of the types of places are ones that are on top of inaccessible rock formations like uh, mesas and buttes or even islands are already flat top or can be flat topped or should I say just topped like Machu Picchu or maybe Table Mountain. The higher and less accessible, the better. The next type of location are the hard rock locations that are suitable for carving out whole buildings or carving buildings into caves or like Petra or the Alora Caves or the Ajanta Caves or even Lalabella or the Kailasa Temple. Another thing is obelisks. If you see obelisks that are ridiculously large um, made completely in stone and of, of a hard stone, um, all one piece, that was the ancients. Others um, may have carved into them at some later time, or should I say scratched into them, but um, the actual obelisk is likely to be from the ancients. Same with the giant statues or the giant boxes. If they're high on Mo's scale, um, they're likely to be of the ancients. Um, in terms of um, things like inscriptions, if the people making the inscrip inscriptions had trouble making the inscriptions, they really did not make the actual statue. So if inscriptions are scratched in, they are not the original um, manufacturer, let's say. Okay, so back to building projects. The first of the great building projects was Tantal, obviously, Atlantis. Its location was chosen because it already had naturally suitable terrain and um, the buildings were block construction. The blocks were megalithic in size and only the most beautiful white, red or black blocks were used. They were mainly white. As for the sites for the university, um, they would be chosen not just as being a good location for the university, but also if the rock is suitable for direct carving. So examples of this are Phoebe and Neb, which are 100% just buildings that cut out of the bedrock. The thing that you see in Petra, um, so that's a good example of, um, of the way it was done. Other sites um, where it's cut into the rock are those that are sunk to ground level. And the reason for this technique is because it's easier to fill the area and then cover it up than to put plants over it and no one would ever know it had ever been there. The university called Peosa, uh, which is the Universe Institute of Water, was built this way, 
so it was sunk into the ground. So now on to the subject of um, why the permanent versus the temporary locations. So obviously all the institutes, plus Tantal itself, were permanent. Whereas the temporary locations were for things like the animal retreats, the, you know, the places, the holiday places where people would go in order to meet animals. Like, you know, I wanted, let's say I wanted um, a cat. That's one of my other episodes, by the way. Um, I'd go to a cat retreat and I'd spend a lot of time there until a cat chose me. Anyway, that was one of the temporary locations. The other temporary location was for the watchers. And um, that was obviously temporary as well because quite often um, a watcher location would be moved. It would be taken away and put somewhere else. And there were plenty of both of the um, animal retreats and the watcher locations. And they were all around the world, mainly in the temperate zone, but they were still in all kinds of places. So the preparatory techniques for the permanent and the um, temporary were essentially the same. Uh, before any building was done, a site would be assessed for stability. It would then be flattened. Uh, sometimes this was a relatively small job, whereas other times it was done on a massive scale. For example, the removal of the top of a mountain or the flattening of a plateau. So a small job would be one where there is a natural rock, like um, I'm going to use the example of Uluru because it's in Australia and everybody knows it. So that would have been the sort of place the ancients would have loved. But they would have flattened the top and then they'd have built a temporary facility on the top of it. Um, so these places are called mesas or I think butets and they were the ones that the ancients really liked because of their strength. They tended to be of harder rock because any soft rock that was around them had already been eroded by whether it's water or sand or wind or whatever. Um, so most of the work was already done by nature. So pre preparing these sorts of sites was, was great and they were really hard to access. Exactly the sort of place that we would create in order to have um, a, a structure in place that the more primitive people living in the area couldn't access. And it would have had uh, a very inaccessible doorway, one that you wouldn't be able to see. You wouldn't even know that it was a door. You can see that the area has been flattened. In fact, in some places you can even see the scoop marks. A bigger job would be a large plateau or taking the top of a mountain, as I said. And the machines for this sort of thing were enormous. After preparing the site to be flat, a plan would be laid out and then indentations cut into the rock for seating the key blocks. This is not so obvious on the permanent sites because there are big blocks sitting in the indentations. But where a location was used and then the blocks removed, the resultant indentations in the flattened base are very obvious. It should be easy to find old abandoned sites based on this alone. If there are any sites where blocks or temporary blocks exist, so these are the prefabricated ones. That basically means that some disaster struck before the blocks or the buildings, that the blocks were made up of, that the buildings were made up of, were, were dismantled. So the only example I can think of in terms of this is Puma Punk Punku. Have I said that right? Uh, it's pretty clear. Um, they've got the prefabricated blocks that I remember and they're just strewn around. They would normally have been taken away. So it must have been something terrible happen. We're going to look at the specific building techniques. First of all, we're going to look at the polygonal 
block construction. It was very good in areas with a tendency for earthquakes. Once the area to be built on was prepared, we would start with some random, very large boulders, shape them a little for the right look and to ensure the sides would be a goodish fit next to each other. So imagining them lying in a straight line for where we wanted them to go onto the already pre-prepared ground. So as we put a, the first boulder in place, it would become the starter for how we had put the others in place. So if you have a look at the example that I've used in the picture, um, you'll see that I've colored in blue the the boulder that would be the one that we tend would tend to start with so i just chose this site because it had a lot of really good um, examples of what i want to talk about so we would use a softening agent on one side of the second boulder and uh, once it had softened the area sufficiently then the second boulder would be put in place and pushed hard against the first boulder any seepage from between the boulders would then have to be scraped out. This process would be done again and again until the base level was completed. So it was basically using genuine block, natural blocks softened on one side and just added to the, the base. So added to, then added to, and then added to. When the stone softening was used, they pushed the stones together and sometimes some of the softened area would protrude out. So basically it would squish out between the blocks. So they didn't want that there. So while it was still soft, they would use a ruler, kind of like a ruler, um, or a, something that they could scrape uh, that part of the rock away. So that, in a nutshell, is the polygonal building process. I'm going to talk about the uh, more standardized blocks, blocks that look like they've been cut or in fact have been cut. So very large blocks and usually cube or, or rectangular sized with two techniques for quarrying the rock that would be, was being cut to, to size. So large chunks were removed from a quarry by drilling strategic holes, filling the holes with an expanding substance, and when done correctly, a large piece could be removed. Then this could be cut to size. Alternatively, a machine was used to scoop out the rock around up the part of the, um, the ground that was required to be taken out, and this was commonly used for when an obelisk or um, a statue was required so that the exact dimensions could be just removed from the bedrock. And this technique is a bit more wasteful, but it is necessary when it came to doing the obelisks and the statues, but not so much necessary when it came to just getting blocks for building purposes. Once quarried, the natural stone blocks were cut to size using the machines and yes, these are the machines that are going to come soon. I'm going to explain them to you, I do promise. Assuming the blocks are cut to the right size or approximately the right size, then fitting them together should be straightforward. But the ancients wanted the fit between blocks to be incredibly tight. So they needed for each block to go through a very specific process with the, each of the blocks that they were going to be placed next to. As each block is placed, they used a machine to create a vibration at a certain frequency which would stimulate the areas they were touching to essentially get the blocks to sand each other down until they were a perfect fit. So now I'm going to try to draw uh, the actual machine. So we've got the two ends that retract and the tape, the flat tape in the middle. The things that look like spools hold the tape into place. You can just pull it to resize it, make it bigger, make it smaller until it's the right size for the block that you're wanting to cut. So the next thing we need is a rod. 
and you can see lots of different types of rods in the pictures in Egypt. But these rods had holes in them, like they were measuring rods. So we need two of these rods, one for each side. So you'll see the arrows pointing downwards where the rods would be placed. And now you can see the rods in place. And of course, this would be placed exactly on the block where the cut is required. Now all we need to do is tell the device to start cutting. So the device would be activated using the watch, which meant that it would start to vibrate. The vibration was at a frequency that would allow the rock to be sliced as if it was a piece of butter and the device was a hot knife. So at the end of all this, you've got uh, two pieces of rock now instead of one piece of rock. As an aside, has anyone noticed the hats of the ancient Egyptians? Some of them have a weird looking proboscis thing sticking out of them. So I've put a couple of pictures that I could find up and the proboscis it looks as if it's part of the mechanism of the device. It's almost like the ancient Egyptians found a broken one of these devices and used a part of it because it was maybe recognized as being from the ancients and used it as one of their hats. So now let's move on to levitation. You see pictures of these devices in many museums that have got um, Egyptian artifacts. So those weird cylinder looking things that the statues are holding are what are called rods of Horus. Some of these rods in, on the statues look flat topped and others looked kind of sausage shaped. But I assure you they are all the same device. If you've listened to my other episodes, then you may remember an episode on flying and the technology around that. So the rods that go around the waist for flight are basically the same technology. So they actually open up in much the same way that the rods that we saw for the cutting actually work as well. So these items look like they're just one rod, but when they're opened up, they are essentially two rods with paper thin, very flexible alloy, I think it is. It's kind of metal, but it's bendable and soft between them, scrolled very tightly. Ideally, you'd have two of these for a block. The crowbar device that I put in the picture is pretty close to one of the types of crowbars we had. The technology has a few complications. The parts of the case, which um, the wafer scrolls up into and, and lives in, they can sit on the end of each end of the wafer. They give the communication um, in terms of activating and deactivating the, the actual wafer. I almost forgot to mention how we achieved the forward momentum. It's really very, very easy. You just push it. So all it took was somebody walking behind the block. Like, I'm just taking my pet rock for a nice walk. So one of the Egyptians had some of that wafer. They didn't have either of the rods that the wafer attaches to, and they certainly didn't have the uh, watch device that was used to control it. But they'd managed to work out how to make the wafer jump. So <laughs> it was really amazing. Um, they got two of these wafers underneath a block and they managed to find, that I don't know how, it must have been trial and error, they managed to find the right frequency. So they whacked the block really hard with what looked like a tuning fork. It made a ringing sound anyway. 
and the block just lifted. They pushed the block and after about、oh, a few meters, it just kept, came back down onto the ground. And so they just whacked it again and it lifted and they just pushed it forward a little bit and then it came down onto the ground. And then they whacked it again and it was very entertaining. They were smart enough to work out that they couldn't whack it while it was still in the air, or it would just go higher and then be out of their control. I guess that's the problem with residual technology. The three massive monster machines used for cutting, drilling, tunneling, and carving stone and bedrock. The massive blocks needed for the statues were cut out from the bedrock. Using the scooping machines, they were scooped all four sides, and then once that was done,、um, the scooping machine went under the、uh, block until there was just a small neck of rock remaining at each end. Then,、uh, two support blocks were put in at each end. The rock that was left attached to the bedrock was then. Removed, so essentially, this giant piece of stone is then just sitting on two supporting blocks. It's so it's really strange to see documents or hieroglyphs of statues being moved by the dynastic Egyptians, and that's because they didn't carve them and then move them, they found them and moved them. And you can see one of the people. Uh, pouring down oil, I think it is, in order to make it easy for the statues to be moved on a sled. And isn't it amazing that they would actually not、um, move the whole block and then carve it if they had the technology to carve it? Because it's risking the statue way more by moving it once carved. So let's talk about polishing now. Whether it's a large one piece of stone sarcophagus, or whether it's a beautifully carved statue、um, of a person sitting or standing or whatever, if it has a high level of polish, then a fair chance is that the technique I'm going to describe next has been used on it. A substance was applied to it. Now this substance was slightly yellowish, and、um, the nearest thing I can describe it to is honey. It looked very much like honey. So the substance could be just poured on. So like if you were dealing with a straight flat object, that's pretty easy. You just pour it on. But once the vibration was applied. It didn't really take very long, maybe five minutes, for the、um, substance to do its job, and the surface was amazingly smooth. So all that was left over at that point was just some very, very fine dust, and it would be beautifully polished. But wherever there was a difference, like if we had a slightly incorrect gradient on. One surface, it would just be a very beautifully polished, incorrect gradient. Polishing was done not just because it looked nice, which obviously it did, but also it was believed that by polishing a stone item, it limited the amount of erosion that would occur on it. I'm not sure how true that was, though. There was one more machine that I hadn't quite squeezed in so far. And this machine was there was quite a few handheld machines, but this one is just a little bit different. Most of the other handheld machines are just like small versions of the big machine, but this one was、um, if you imagine a rod,、um, well, any kind of stick, in fact. And then on that rod, you put the ice cream scoop devices that we talked about, but you make those devices so 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 tiny. And you make them all in a little, all in a line, and so they're absolutely tiny and all in a line, attached to this this rod with a with a handle on it, and 
it's so tiny that you can't actually see these little tiny, tiny, tiny scoops. And what you end up with is this device whereby when you switch on the frequency and you take this device up close to a, a piece of stone, you can literally slice through that piece of stone with the device when it's vibrating.